if you're thinking of going into private practice because you don't like working for the man, which I have done for many, many years, and I get it, I refer to this five forces analysis that Michael Porter produced many, many years ago at the Harvard Business School. What do you need to think about to inform your strategy as a business? So number one, medicine is a business. So you need to at least start thinking of it as a business, so not just as a practice or whatever you think medicine is about. Um, it's, it is a business. Um, so if you're going to go into business for yourself, that is, you're going to create a, so a private practice, then the five forces that you need to consider are competition. So is there a lot of competition out there for what you're doing? You bet. Just read the newspaper. I mean, in terms of who's doing what and care delivery. Um, are there new entrants every day? You read about Walmart, Costco, you name it, that are trying to reinvent the business model. AI companies, tech is a gazillion new entrants, which I would say has accelerated very rapidly over the last couple of years. The third is the power of suppliers. So the power of suppliers means because we're actually talking, you know, we're talking about a, a supply chain issue. Um, well, it's more and more consolidated. And if anything, the power of the medical industrial complex has increased. So the supplier power over the physician power is growing. The fourth one is the power of customers. So who's the customer? There's lots of customers. There's lots of stakeholders. But if we're talking about the power of the patient, their power has increased because of social media, because of societal norms, because of disgust with the system, because of all kinds of economic factors, um, inequality, et cetera, et cetera, digital divide, et cetera, et cetera. And the final one is the threat of substitutes. Well, doctors are being replaced by fill in the blank, pharmacists, nurses, Anybody with another initial after their name, they're all doctors. Yeah. Did you see the, the article here in California that there was a group of nurse practitioners suing because yeah. they, for the right to use the title doctor? Right. Well, that's an example. So, yeah. and you know, we could get into that conversation with scope practice creep, but that's going to take us down a deep rabbit hole. So, but, but that's the <laughs> one. Point. We're down one rabbit hole right now. We're, we got to head already, back to another right, rabbit hole. We're, we're already three feet deep already. So. So all of these forces, competition, new entrants, power of the supplier, power of the customers, threat of substitutes are headwinds if you're a doctor thinking about going out to work. So you have to consider all this stuff. Now, that's probably the reason that most medical students and residents have zero interest in going into private practice. They just don't want to deal with the hassles and the threats and the risk and the debt and the brain damage, all I want to do is practice medicine, right? But what they don't understand is if you don't have a business, if you don't care about the business of medicine, you have no business practicing medicine. I don't care how you do it. It's just something you have to understand. So that, that sets the stage. Now, in the midst of all this, the environment adds some more stuff. And I call these the various revolutions that are going on. One is the anti-capitalism rev revolution, which is I'm fed up with medicine in the United States being a privilege and not a right. And it's all because of the greedy capitalists who are taking money and couldn't give a damn about me as a patient. Number two, the fourth industrial revolution, which is what we are living in, in terms of the cyber world. And how do we deal with big data, with artificial intelligence, with technology, with integration of all of these things. How do we get our arms around that? Number three, I don't know what to do about this truly disruptive innovation. That's what people are saying. As Christian, as you know, as Schopenhauer described it many years ago, and as Chris, Clay Christensen sort of did a really good job of sort of amplifying it, but the terms have been diluted. What he truly meant with disruptive innovation is the existing business model is obsolete and somebody is going to change it because you didn't. And, and that's an adequate description of what of the sick care system of systems. It, it's totally dysfunctional and people are fed up. So and it's it's a self-afflicted wound. Doctors, medical societies, medical schools, graduate programs that they're heading their sand for so long 
somebody came along and disrupted it. It was it was theirs for the taking. So you have to deal with that reality. And finally, there's the death of expertise. So everybody with an opinion is an expert fueled by social media and their suspicions about doctors and scientists and COVID and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're dealing with, again, you're a resident, eight months, you're going to have to decide where to go to work. You have to deal with, with what I've just mentioned. You have to it, think about this stuff. And then you have to uh, fight the battles. And primarily, they revolve around what I call the four Ps, power, productivity, professionalism, and purpose. That's what doctors are trying to regain. And they're unable to do it for the number of reasons we just explained, not the we which is they're not given the knowledge, skills, abilities, and competencies to do it. And various entities have abrogated their responsibility to empower physicians. So everybody's angry and they want power, physician power. They want to be able to be more productive because their income is under threat. They miss the lost tribe of medicine. They want to be more attached to the community, the quote, old way we used to do things. Now, admittedly, some of them were silly and ridiculous, but the point is pe tribes mean something. When people go into medicine and they become doctors, part of their affiliation is, thank God I'm a doctor and I'm, I can talk to any other doctor in the world and be part of the tribe. They miss that. That's, go that's going away. And finally, the sense of purpose. I mean, why did I go into this thing? Now, admittedly, part of it had to do with self-interest, but a lot of it had to do with serving the community in terms of healthcare and taking care of folks and relieving sickness and illness and all that other stuff, some more so than others, but it's a, it's a duality. So having set that stage and that's the environment that you're going into, if, so that's the, I didn't go into that environment to the extent that it is present now because I went into practice, quote, during the good old days. Uh, things obviously have changed. A significant number of people were in private practice when I went into private practice, and particularly in my specialty, ear, nose, and throat. Uh, if you look at the number now, if you look at the number of specialties that actually are in private practice, P, uh, ENT is fairly high on the list. Now that's changing somewhat. Pediatrics, they don't work for the man. They, they have, they have, so, so there are different specialties in terms of who works for whom. And, but back in the day when I did it, uh, things were pretty different, but the realities were the same. It's just the dynamics were different. The equation was there. It's just the numbers you plugged in were different, particularly with the forces thing. So, I wind up going into private, so having said all that, I wind up going into private practice. And the bottom line is most things that you don't know have to do with the hidden curriculum. So there are two courses in the hidden curriculum, things you should have learned but didn't, but you, you get from experience and from just being in the culture and just from doing it. And the second part are um, things that you learned that were wrong. People told you stuff and it's just not right. That's not that's what not what I found when I got there. So what were some of those things? Well, uh, one was um, uh, internal financial. Con the, it's essentially the business. The main thing is there's a difference between practice management and practice entrepreneurship. Practice management is an, is an operations function. You have to do it to keep the heat, light and electricity on. But in terms of differentiating yourself and being innovative, and, and being different and growing your practice, that requires an entrepreneurial mindset, not just a clinical mindset. Mm. Is that why you say, I mean, in your article, you mentioned like, stop calling it medical practice ma management. Yes. Now, because, you, and, and the unfortunate reality is that when people go into private practice, there's a whole bunch of folks that want you to pay them to help you, quote, run your practice, medical practice management. And uh, the medical organizations, the professional societies, the, the medical group entrepreneurship society, they're called the medical group management association. So it's essentially managing a professional services organization. It's not leading and innovating in a professional services organization. Yeah, it's. I think it's important to understand those are two very, very different They're things. Very two necessary 
but different things. You actually have to have both. It's like one is strat, like how do you put yourself out of business before somebody else does? And that's what we're facing now. How do you rethink primary care before Walmart or Costco or Amazon puts you out of business? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a big question and it's really, it can be daunting. I think, I don't know, the one thing that my mind goes to when you say that is like really getting better about patient care. And I think that, again, a lot of doctors, they don't like to think of like the patient as the customer and everything, but you have to. I mean, for example, I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a patient. I went to a doctor, uh, I remember sometime last year, and it was the last time I went to them because I was just like really annoyed by the quality of hospitality and the reception, like when I was checking in. It was like the worst process I've ever seen. And I was like, no, I'm not dealing with this, you know, because I'm paying for it, you know? Right. And that's something that has to be addressed in the system as well, because what we, that's an example of a conflict in values. And by value, I mean business value. So doctors pretty much focus on quality. You ask a doctor, what's the most important thing? Quality of care. You ask a medical association, what do we focus on most? Helping you develop quality of care. Unfortunately, that is not the main value factor for most patients. So from a business perspective, you should be doing the job that the customer wants you to do. Now, do patients want quality of care? Sure. They don't want you to screw it up, but they're no longer putting up with all the other stuff and the inconvenience to get what they perceive to be quality of care. First of all, there's no way for them to know what's quality of care and what isn't. The doctor doesn't even know what's quality of care and what isn't. So what they do is they, meaning patients and other stakeholders, use other value factors as surrogates for quality of care, service, convenience, bedside manner, price, parking, availability, speed, ease of use, access on the internet, what's your website like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The unfortunate reality is that there's no correlation between the things that I just mentioned and quality of care, but that's not what the patients want now. That's not their primary concern. You know, it used to be the price of entry was you graduated from medical school, hung up a shingle. That's not going to work anymore because of the things that I mentioned in the five forces, new entrants, threat of substitutes, competition, people offering what customers want.